1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 1. Paul writes, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the good news I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this good news you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. Thus far the reading of God's word. As the expression goes, um, I have bad news and I have good news for you this morning. Um, and I open with those words because Paul uses this interesting expression, which, though we have heard it often enough in the Christian church, it's one that I think deserves some attention. Paul says that I preach to you the good news. How is it that the Bible comes to summarize God's saving message for sinful mankind as good news? It could have been called any number of things, and of course that metaphor of news or tidings would not have to be used at all. And so I'd like to talk to you this morning about news, uh, about tidings. In the ancient world, one of the most exciting things that would happen in a, a town or a large city would be for a messenger to become to come running in through the gates of the city, declaring the news of what's happening outside the city. And uh, there were some very strange conventions. Children, let's be listening. There are some very strange conventions that uh, the ancient world knew with the tidings that uh, messengers would bring. Uh, if a messenger were to run into the city and say that the, uh, the news about warfare were, was bad news for the occupants of that city, they would kill the messenger. Uh, a very strange and perverse turn of mind saying that if the man brought bad news, he must be the cause of the bad news or something like that. And you can imagine what might happen today if we were to treat the people who are on the evening news with the same kind of mentality, <laughs> we would run out of newscasters very quickly, wouldn't we? Now, what's the reason for that? Uh, well, you know, it's, if you think about the news that uh, we have, it, it probably would be true throughout the whole history of mankind, but I think particularly today, because of the uh, shrinking of the world and the fact that we are aware of what's happening around the world, the fact that... Uh, that nothing can happen even on the other side of the globe without us knowing within two hours' time by satellite or by telephone. Um, we're just keeping up on a lot more, and it's just the whole history of mankind has been such bad news that we're getting a lot more bad news uh, uh, coming into our homes uh, via the daily paper or the evening news or just by word of mouth. And we are indeed having a lot of bad news today. I mean, you can think of any number. What, what's the worst story of the week? I mean, you can almost have a competition, right? Is it the failure of our efforts in Iran? Is it the fact that there's political unrest somewhere in the world? Is it the economy? What is the worst news you can think of? And there's almost kind of a perversion that's possible in our own culture today by people thinking, getting up at 7 o'clock and watching the news, what else could have happened that's so bad? Let's see if we can top yesterday's bad news. Now, this morning, I don't want to tell you so much about any particular piece of bad news that you hear on the evening news, but I would like to focus on the character of what we call news. You know, the expression, no news is good news. Why is that? Because news in the nature of the case in our day and age is bad. Uh, although um, evening newscasters have gone to the cute habit of closing their newscast with some interesting 
human interest story, sometimes it's good news. For the most part, when you, when you turn on the TV or you open your paper, what you're reading is something making news because of its evil or bad effects, by its bad character. No news is good news because news is bad in the nature of the case. And so if there isn't any news to be told, that is to say there's nothing bad to be told. So no news is good news. Now, as much as we may think this is something of a modern perspective, I mean, with our 6 o'clock news and all the rest, the Bible indicates that men uh, in the days of uh, uh, the development of the Bible and God's uh, work in history to bring the Savior knew very well the character of their lives and knew how bad the news of man was in the nature of the case. If you'll turn to the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, you'll get a very strong dosage of this fact that no news is good news. What I want to look at uh, beginning this morning is the bad news of man, and then I'd like to look at the good news of God. Ecclesiastes means preacher in Hebrew, and this is somebody who is declaring a message to people, and the, and the theme of this message is very important. Ecclesiastes 1, beginning at verse 2, and if you're using the new um, international version, it begins, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. It wasn't written this week, you see, as a description of Western culture was written many years ago as the preacher, most likely Solomon, reflected on all that he saw about him. What does man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? Some of you are wondering about that as you've been working very hard. What's it for? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full, to the place the streams come from where they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, or the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. There is no remembrance of men of old, and even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. Bad news. And that's the nature of the case. As man looks at the world without the eyes of faith, he looks around him and he sees the confusion of mind. You have people asking, what is truth? What is life all about? Who am I? What am I all about? Where am I going? How can I know things? What should I know? What should I do? How should I live? You know, the whole history of human thought, which has been something of an area of special study in, in terms of my, um, my education, uh, the history of philosophy, offers no news, only recurring general themes. And the themes are those of despair and of skepticism. The whole history of thought offers no answers for mankind. And so the preacher says in Ecclesiastes 1 at verse 16, I thought to myself, look, I have grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly, but I learned that this too is a chasing after wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. So why, why go to school? Some of you may be thinking that for other reasons, but the writer, the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying, well, after you've learned it all, what you've learned is a whole bunch of reasons to be sad. Look at the grief around you. Look at the sorrow. Is the history of mankind something noble, something fantastic? Is it something to rejoice in? Far from it. Well, we turn from the confusion of man's mind to the aimlessness of man's life and work. Why do we go through the same senseless routine day after day? What's the use of this rat race in which we are caught? There doesn't seem to be any honor or any purpose in work. And um, a whole sermon, I think, could be preached just on the whole mentality toward work and labor today. 
um, people have just lost their sense of, of why they are working. It's nothing but a, a dull drag. It's a routine. And uh, there's no uh, pride in the work that is done for the most part as a generalization. Well, Ecclesiastes 2, verse 11, tells us, Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was, a, was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Man looks upon the works of his hands and he says, What's it for? Why bother? And then, of course, if it isn't enough to realize that the whole history of education and, and our thoughts and philosophy is for nothing, and all of our daily work is for nothing, the preacher tells us that if you look around you, you will see evil hearts, violence and lawlessness, the pride of life, the lust of life, anger, deception, interpersonal relations are not what they're supposed to be. So in Ecclesiastes 4, the first three verses, he adds, again I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. And I declared that the, I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. And I think it would not be difficult, if you're sensitive at all, to bring tears to your eyes if I were to tell you of the oppression of most of the world today, of what life is like in countries that don't have freedom. And of course, we talked about the meaninglessness and the, and the futility of life in our own country where we have the freedom to do what we want, but the oppression around the world is appalling. The stinking open graves of all the tyrants of history. And preacher says, I looked around and I saw powers on the, on the side of the, of the oppressor. And there's no comfort for those who are oppressed. And then he thought about himself, this preacher did, and he thought about the guilt and the anxiety and the uncomfortable conscience that he himself has. In Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9, we read these words, Be happy, young men, while you are young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart, and whatever your eyes see, but know that for all these things will God bring you to judgment. And there's a message for the young people of our congregation here. I need not name you or bring out uh, particulars of your own life, but the, uh, the preacher says, just do what you want while you're young. Enjoy it. Do whatever your eyes tell you to do. Follow out what you see. And know for certain that you'll have a guilty conscience and God will bring you to judgment for it. And then if that isn't enough to see the confusion of our minds and the aimlessness of our work, the evil of our hearts, the violence of the world, the guilt of our youth, the psalmist says, when all is said and done, the great leveler is death. And so the preacher says in Ecclesiastes 2, verses 16 and 17, for the wise man, like the fool, will not be long remembered. In days to come, both will be forgotten. Like the fool, the wise man, too, must die. Why improve your mind? Why get all this information stuffed into your head? Because you know in the grave it isn't going to do you a bit of good, and the wise man and the fool are going to have the same end. Ecclesiastes 3, 19 and 20. He adds this. Man's fate is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Man has no advantage over the animal. Everything is meaninglessness. All go to the same place. All come from dust, and to dust all return. Look at Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. This thought of death is permeating what he says. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the grave, where you are going... There is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. Now do you understand why the preacher began this book by saying, meaningless, everything is meaningless. And I tell you that the message is as contemporary as you could ask for. 
as I counsel in my own individual experience, as I hear the counseling of others, as I look at what's happening in our world about us, as I know the needs of people, I tell you this is as contemporary as you could ask for. Everything is meaningless. As man looks at the world under the sun, as he looks at his life, as he looks at anything that might give purpose, he sees nothing but guilt and death and despair. There is mourning and sickness of heart about us. And in our own day, to add to this, we don't have in our culture the answer of the preacher. Because you know the preacher, having gone through all of this, waits until the very end of the epistle, to the very end of his writing, when he says that all that he had seen, he had been seeing through the eyes of a sinful man. This is what the eyes that do not have faith tell you about the world. And it's so true without faith. All that is true about the world. And he concludes that this is what we all should learn, is to fear the Lord God and keep his commandments. Okay, so he turns it around. At the end. But in our day and age, that isn't the conclusion. At the end of the 6 o'clock news, our newscasters don't say, and so for all the bad news, don't let this get you down. God is in control. God has a plan. God has sent his son. God is working all things out. No. The end of our newscast, if they were honest, would be whatever God we believe in is irrelevant and powerless and impotent and blind. For the most part, God is irrelevant and dead. He's not invoked. He's unable to enter the world or my life. And if we talk about Jesus at all in our culture, Jesus is, of course, but a man for men. What a terrible insult to the Lord of glory. A man for men. An example. A good, honest man. A loving person. A good teacher. Well, the conclusion, I think, is man's bad news then. Life becomes somewhat like a car that we call a lemon. And that's bad news, not just because the car is a lemon. But you know very well, if you have a car that's a lemon, that it seems like there's nothing you can do to make it right. I mean, one thing is done, and you hope that it's going to work out, and then another thing goes wrong, and then another. You see, a car that's a lemon, is, a, unless we're exaggerating, is a lemon because it's not a car. It's a lemon. There's nothing you can do to make it a car. <laughs> and life about us, the bad news about us, says that we are lemons. Or if you want to change the metaphor, we are junk. The Bible has some very good news for you today. You're not junk. You're not a lemon. You're a sinner. And you say, wait a minute, that's not good news, but it is. Oh, it's very good news that you're not junk. Because, you see, junk is irredeemable. Junk has no inherent honor. Junk has no destiny, but of course, the junk pile. But you're not junk, and you're not a lemon. You're a sinner. And in that is the bad news from God as well as the good news, because God can do something about sinners. Nobody can do something about junk. But God made you as his own precious image. God made you as one that has honor and worth and dignity and purpose. Now, of course, you've spoiled all that. You've spoiled that because you thought your own wisdom is wiser than God's. You've spoiled that because you haven't found it important to listen to God's Word. You've spoiled that because you've taken it to yourself to manage your life. Frank Sinatra sings the song for us all, doesn't he? When all is said and done, I did it my way. Yeah, what a terrible testimony. How would you like that written on your headstone, the tombstone of your life, actually your death? He did it his way. And so we have ruined God's good news about who we are. We were made as his image, and he, um, he loved us. He had a grand plan for us, a wonderful environment in which to live, purpose. And we decided to go our own way. And the Bible tells you that the bad news from God is that he will judge sinners and he, his judgment will be unremitted. That one sin in the sight of God is worthy of eternal damnation. Some people have thought, isn't God just a little too hard? I mean, to, to err is human, right? That's a terrible rationalization. Humans were not made to sin. They were not made to be imperfect. They were not made to spoil and ruin their lives. They were made to honor God and enjoy Him forever. 
And so, James tells us that if a man keeps the whole law and yet violates in one little minor detail, he's broken the whole. Because God's looking for whole men, not broken men. And if we've broken our lives and we've broken the honor that belongs to us as the image of God, if we've turned from Him and failed to image His righteousness at even one point, you see, all is broken. And in the sight of God, we are lost. And there is no hope for us in this world. And we are like that preacher who says everything is meaningless. Now, when Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, I wrote to you what was of foremost importance. Now, there's a lot in this Bible I could have preached about today. But I've chosen to preach about that which is of the highest significance and importance. Paul says, I want to remind you of the good news I preached to you. As I've come to your cities, as I've come to your congregations, I didn't bring bad news. I didn't come and tell you you were junk. I didn't come and say you were a lemon. I didn't say God wasn't sovereign and wasn't in control. I brought good news to you. And he says the good news is according to the Scriptures. It's interesting to me that Paul should say this to a Gentile church. If he was preaching to Jews, you'd expect him to keep referencing the Scriptures. But even to Gentiles, Paul said, my good news is according to the Word of God. That which you're not familiar with is nevertheless the standard even in your churches and for you. God's Word is the exclusive standard because he says, brothers, I remind you of the good news I preached, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this good news you are saved if you hold firmly to the Word I preached to you, but otherwise... Outside of that, whatever message has been brought to you, you've believed it for nothing. And I think about the many, many, many pulpits in our land today where there is news being given to people, tidings being preached that's not good news. And even that which appears to be good news because it's not according to the Scriptures, Paul says you've believed it for nothing. It'll avail you nothing. You are still lost. You're still in your sins. If you don't believe the good news I'm giving you, Paul says, then it's all for naught. Paul's good news is this, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Christ died for our sins. The good news begins at a very ugly point, and that's the point of sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, this morning, I'd like you to listen to that again. The problem is you've all heard it too many times before in one sense because it's become too general a truth, so general that it doesn't pinch and it doesn't hurt to tell you that all have sinned. That means the children, and that means their parents, that means the adults, that means whoever's here, all have sinned. And God does not, you see, put us on some kind of scale where we can be evaluated over against our neighbors. We've done a little bit better than them. After all, we're faithful in our attendance. Paul says all have sinned. Makes no difference if you're a church member, if you're a good parent, you're still a sinner. Makes no difference if you do a pretty good job of obeying. If you've broken the law at one point, you've broken it all. All have sinned. Proverbs 30 tells us there's a generation that is clean in their own eyes, and yet their filth has not departed. We live in such a generation of self-righteous complacency. We live in a generation where people think they're pretty good, as all things uh, taken into account, if you, uh, if you want to consider the whole picture. We live in a generation where even in the church of Jesus Christ, the thought of sin and repentance is an ugly thought. If you preach those sorts of things, you're not preaching what people want to hear. Isaiah was a preacher of good news. In fact, if you look at Isaiah 40, Isaiah 52, and Isaiah 61, three major chapters in this large prophecy, the point is how blessed is the one who brings good tidings to God's people. Isaiah brought God good tidings, but it began with this word, that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. And actually, if I'm going to be honest with you this morning, all of our righteousness is not filthy rags. That's a Victorian translation of the truth. Because the filthy rags are much better than what Isaiah is talking about. In the Old Testament, a woman who was in her menstrual period 
was considered unclean, ceremonially unclean in the eyes of God. And she had to go through a purification rite. And Isaiah says, all that good that you think you're doing is menstruous cloth. And you say, Isaiah, you shouldn't talk like that in public. That's foul. And he says, and so are you. God's good news begins at a very ugly place, our self-righteousness and our sin. Indeed, Ephesians tells us we are dead in our trespasses and sin. We're not just living, just kind of floundering around. You're dead. 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 Now, stop and think for a moment. If your loved ones knew the thoughts of your heart, if your loved ones knew the way you had lived, I want you to stop and think how embarrassed you would be if someone that you thought well of and someone who loved you were to find out how sinful you really are and knew the character of your life, the character of your life. You know, not many of us parade our sins. There are people. And the Christian church fosters the idea of somebody who's been a drug addict or a murderer or something coming to the Lord. And we kind of play that up and say, isn't that wonderful? God saves even these ugly sinners. I'm afraid the... Um, terrible effect of that is that it comforts us to think, well, you know, we're pretty good. Look how bad that guy was. But I want you to stop and think. If someone knew the character of your life, how would you feel? How embarrassed you would be. And God knows it all. God hasn't missed a moment. Not one passing thought has not been recorded in his book. Oh, there may be a generation that's washed in their own eyes, but they're filth has not departed. All of our righteousness is menstruous cloth in the eyes of God. But Paul says, I've got good news for sinners. And it's according to the Scriptures. God said it. I didn't make it up. God told me this in a revelation of Jesus Christ. What I've received from the Lord I pass on to you, that Christ died for our sins. Christ didn't simply die for our not doing the best job we could do. Christ didn't just, you see, make up the difference between our imperfect performance and what God was looking for. Christ died for our sins, and that according to the Scriptures. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 that the one who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. How is that possible that God can look at people and see menstruous cloth and then look again and see righteousness? Because Christ took it upon himself. In Colossians, the second chapter, Paul says the handwriting that was against us, that indictment, our death warrant, quite literally, was nailed to the cross of Christ. And as Christ rose from the grave, he brought life to us. Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 6, 7, and 8. Paul tells us how good God's news is. He tells us, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us, and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Not while we cleaned up our act, Christ died. Not when we said, look, we'll do our best from now on, God. While we were sinners, while we were ungodly, he died. You would think it would be worthwhile to die for somebody who was going to make the effort. But when we were powerless to do anything, when we were impotent, and when we could say there's nothing in us to commend ourselves to you, God, Christ died for us. We've seen the bad news of man and the junk that man has become in his own eyes. The good news from God is that sinners are redeemable and sinners have been redeemed. Indeed, we talked about if someone who knew your sinfulness and your real character were to find out, if someone you loved were to find out, how could you ever face them? Have you ever stopped to think about it? 
the good news is that the one who knows me best loves me most. And that's amazing. The one who knows me best of all loves me more than anyone else. I can understand people not knowing me, thinking well of me. They don't know the truth. But God knows the truth. And still he has loved me. The good news is that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's why Paul said it's so important that you not believe anything else. Because nothing else will save you. And nothing else will bring your life before the presence of God and find acceptance. And so what I receive, I pass on to you as being of the highest importance today, more important than any other doctrine you might learn, more important than anything the world might say, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that by the grace of God, we are what we are. Let us pray. Lord, we love You because You can take miserable wretches such as we are and turn our lives into trophies of grace. We love you because you loved us when we were unlovable. We love you because we really owe you everything. We love you because you have redeemed us when we were without power, when we were yet ungodly, when we yet did not care a thing for you. You sent your Son. And Lord, we thank you that your Spirit does now prick our hearts, does make us sensitive to what we are, to what we would be if it were not for the grace of God. We love you, Father, even in the face of that fearful and awesome truth that you know every moment and every second of our lives, our every thought. We love you because though you know us so well, you still have loved us. Thank you for your goodness and mercy. Do strengthen us that we might be in our lives, in our experience, and by our witness, trophies of the mercy of God. And we thank you for giving us today good news that the world cannot offer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.